Good afternoon, everyone. Um, how's everyone doing? I hope you're all enjoying this wonderful Friday afternoon. Um, my name is Tara Nguyen, and I am the Vice President of the Sociology Club here at Eastern. I have the absolute pleasure of introducing Dr. Dennis Canterbury, a professor in the Sociology Department, and Emily Grout, a so student in the Sociology Department, to discuss Dr. Canterbury's last book, Neo-Extractivism and Capitalist Development. Dr. Canterbury is currently an associate professor of sociology here at Eastern Connecticut State University. He received his PhD from Binghamton University and has done extensive research on sustainable development, neoliberal globalization, and international economic partnerships. He published Neoliberal De Democratization and New Authoritarianism in 2005, where he discusses globalization and democratization through the process of change in authoritarian states. In 2009, Dr. Canterbury won the Connecticut State University System-wide Research Award. He has been a visiting professor at the University of Cape Coast, Ghana, and has taught a plethora of courses at Eastern, including the Sociology of Globalization and the Sociology of Labor. In his latest book, Dr. Canterbury discusses how global demand and resource extraction plays a role in the development of exporting countries. Emily Grout is a junior here at Eastern Connecticut State University and is double major in sociology and history and social sciences. Throughout her time at Eastern, she has maintained a 4.0 GPA and volunteered at the Center for Community Engagement. After finishing her bachelor's degree in May of 2020, Emily intends to pursue a master's degree in secondary education and has aspirations of teaching high school history and eventually obtaining a PhD in history with a concentration in historical sociology. By obtaining a double major bachelor's degree, Emily has dreams of combining both her passions of sociology and history to continue her desired occupational choice of teaching secondary and higher education. Without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Canterbury and Emily Grout. Okay, thank you all so much for being here today. Um, we're gonna start off with a question from the very first paragraph of the book, um, where you mentioned the concept that periphery and developing countries that are abundant sources of natural extraction are stuck with the dilemma of feeling cursed rather than blessed. Can you expand on this idea, and how do you think that the economies of both the developing and developed countries would be altered if the center capitalist countries withdrew their commodity-based development strategies. Well, Emily, before I get started, I would like to thank you for doing this. And I would also like to thank Dr. Nick Simon for putting this together, as well as the Sociology Club. So um, why don't you give yourselves a round of applause, especially the club. <laughs> now, <clears throat> I'm referring here to the fact that after decades of interaction with developed economies, the countries of the capitalist periphery remain in the same positions of poverty. This is sometimes referred to as the resource curse or the paradox of plenty, where countries with an abundance of natural resources tend to have less economic growth and development and undemocratic political systems compared with fewer natural resources, countries that have fewer natural resources. So oil producing countries, for example, are always under the gun of the hegemonic powers unless they cooperate in the exploitation of the natural resources. We don't have to look far. We may look at countries like Iran Iraq, Venezuela, as examples of countries that are experiencing this type of phenomenon that we're descri describing. If the developed countries were to get their fair share of the wealth produced from the natural resources they own, they will be much better off. Granted that corruption is a contributing factor to the development dilemma of those countries, it is very difficult, to, it is important to note that corruption is not the mere, is not the only factor that is causing them, uh, the developing countries not to become developed. Some of these states have managed nonetheless to use the pittance they receive from selling their natural resources to push the development envelope, improving their, the conditions of their peoples. 
Now, about the question of withdrawal of commodity-based development strategies by the rich countries, that is to say, that is a non-starter. The developed countries wouldn't stop extracting natural resources because the capitalist economy is founded on the production of commodities. Even though nowadays we talk about the um, production of services and the conversion of services into commodities, in fact, um, and that in itself has generated millions of dollars, billions of dollars to the people in Wall Street. The, the fact is that we still need to have resources, natural resources, so that to produce commodities like your cell phones, etc. So it's a very important part of the capitalist system. So there is no way, to my mind, that they are going to stop extracting natural resources. Do you think that these periphery countries that you named, like Iraq, Iran, Venezuela, do you think that they profit at all from this resource extraction? Of course, there is, um, there is uh, some amount of um, wealth that accrue to those countries. But the point is that when you make the comparison between the countries that are extracting the resources and the countries that have plenty of resources, we notice that um, the, the disparity is, is extremely high and significant. So that um, even though Venezuela was a country in which was, um, I've been there at one time, a country that was so advanced because of its oil, it got even better when they were able to exercise greater control over the resource and use the money to develop their own society rather than to have the monies flowing abroad to um, accumulate and accrue in a foreign country. Right. Um, for the next question, uh, would you say that the ethnic and national competition seen within the development of Guyana served as a distraction for the criminal government to exploit the resources and the capital development throughout the country? And do you think this is a valid representation of the ethnic competition model used often in the collective behavioral theories? Well, the race problem in Guyana was deliberately created by British colonialism as a divide and rule tactic. This fact is documented in the correspondences between the colonial office in England and the representatives of the British monarchy in the region, in the Caribbean region. The local elites comprising African and East Indian Guyanese continue to exploit the race differences to their advantage. The East Indian ruling elites will give the impression to the East Indian rank and file that they are ruling in the interest of East Indians. The African ruling elites, they would do the same thing. But the reality is that the African and East Indian rulers, they both rule in their class interests. They're ruling in their self-interest and not in the interests of the rank and file people that they set apart from one another. And we find this is the case not merely in Guyana. We just had a class where we had a discussion like that. We find this to be here in the United States as well and in other places. Now, although the two dominant races in Guyana are described as ethnic sections, the problem is really a race problem and not an ethnic problem. Ethnic problems are more severe, as we have seen in places like Rwanda and Kosovo, where there were attempts at ethnic cleansing. We have no such problem in Guyana. However, political and economic competition among Essenians and Africans might have similar effects as portrayed in ethnic competition model. And, um, but I think it's important for us to note that we don't really have an ethnic problem as such. It's a problem of um, two distinct racial groups. Right. Um, while investigating the principles of the US State Department activities in the natural resource rich periphery countries, you suggested in the book that the actions of the department are only really in the interest of the U.S. capitalist relations. 
This was reminiscent to me of the classic theory developed in the colonial age called the white man's burden, as many of you have probably heard of. Um, do you believe that the actions of the U.S. State Department within the extraction of natural resources of the periphery countries are comparable to this theory? You see, Emily, the white man's burden was hatched in the idea about European supremacy over Africans and Asians. It's hidden and at times divulged meaning was that the Europeans were superior to the so-called darker races and that the Europeans had the burden to civilize the savages. Those are in quotes. But of course, there is no such truth in the idea about European civilization of the so-called savages in quotes. Indeed, the idea has turned out to be that the Europeans really wanted to rob by plundering the countries on the capitalist periphery of their wealth to develop Europe, claiming the higher ground that they were civilizing them. The literature is there in support of these points that I'm making. All peoples have their own civilizations. The late Walter Rodney makes this point best in his classic book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. I pointed out in my book, Neo Extractivism and Capitalist Development, about the actions of the US State Department to help natural resource rich countries to manage their resources are really like asking the cat to watch the milk. The US State Department functions in the interests of the US, not in the interests of the natural resource rich countries. So, it has nothing to do with bringing civilization to anybody that I submit. It's all about protecting the interests of the U.S. corporations that invest in natural resources extraction. And do you think that while the U.S. is trying to promote and defend this idea of neo-extractivism in these um, periphery countries, do you think that they're trying to promote this as a benefit for everyone, not just themselves, but still maintaining that self-interest as a business? Well, the, um, the US promotes these, the, I think here is the thing. The countries that have natural resources in the so-called third world, those countries are also poor, but those countries are seeking a greater share of the wealth that they produce. But then they're accused of being corrupt and they're told that it is corruption that is the cause that they're poor and not because their resources are being exploited. So the US State Department comes into the picture along with the World Bank to say, listen, if you have a problem with corruption and you have a problem with poor management of your resources, then we're going to help you to manage those resources. We're going to help you to avoid the corruption in the sectors, in the natural resources sectors. And therefore, by so doing, you're going to be able to become better off. Because rather than the money's going down the pike in terms of people siphoning the money off to put it in their private accounts in the United States and in Europe, then those monies become available domestically so that you can then um, invest it in natural resources development. So in a sense, um, it's both the, um, in a real sense, the countries can benefit from the resources if they're given the opportunity to keep most of the wealth that the resources generate, but which wealth accrue abroad rather than domestically. All right. And Within this book, when uh, talking about the natural resources and neo-extractivism, you chose to use Karl Marx as a central theorist within this book on his economic theories. And do you believe that the current capitalist ventures on the extraction of these natural resources through the new age technologies that we've seen in the modern era can be compared to the machinery advancement of the industrial revolution that Karl Marx focused so heavily on? I think the new age technology is built 
on the Industrial Revolution. In my view, the Industrial Revolution was more significant than the revolution in the new technologies. But there is a contrary view. There are people who argue that this new information technology, information communication technology revolution is, is even more fundamental than the revolution in industry. But I think that um, that's an overzealous type of position to adopt because the industrial revolution represented the application of science to industry. The revolution in ICT is not as fundamental as the initial processes involved in harnessing science and then making machines. So you use science to create a machine. The new age technology is still building on that process. So they're really coming in at the top and not really at the foundation of the system. Now concerning the second part of the question with respect to Marx, um, it is merely the method of Marx that was used as a central idea in conducting the research and analyzing the data to write the book. Uh, moving on to a later chapter of the book, um, you mentioned very delineated terms about capitalism, such as agricultural capitalism, industrial capitalism, and commercial capitalism. Uh, are these terms uh, valid or just simply a way to distract the general public and the workers of the means of production into realizing like the true intentions and the essence of capitalism and capitalist development? No. It is not a way to distract the public. It is merely to help the public to understand that capitalism is not a homogenous phenomenon. There are many different types of capitalists operating in different sectors in the economy. Working people have to understand this important fact in conducting their struggle for social change. The various branches of capital are even in contradiction with each other. Take illegal immigration as an example. There are capitalist enterprises that employ illegal immigrants and make a profit off of them. But there are capitalist enterprises that oppose the employment of illegal immigrants because they don't hire them. So the argument is that those who hire illegal immigrants are in a better position with respect to the cost of labor compared with those who do not. Because when you hire an illegal immigrant, you pay them less than you would pay someone an American worker. So the companies that hire, the capitalists that hire, the American worker would have a higher cost of up labor costs compared with the company that hire the illegal immigrant that would have a lower labor cost. And so the argument is it's not fair competition, and this is why that's the economic argument that is presented against um, immigration, illegal immigration. So um, the question, therefore, is not a it's not an issue of whether or not um, different types of capitalists confusing the people. The use of those terms would to sort of uh, confuse the, the people. I think it's more of a question of trying to understand the contradictions that operate even within the capitalist class classes. And do you think that these workers and these general publics and people of the periphery countries have enough exposure to these capitalist developments um, to truly understand the exploitation that's occurring within their own countries? Well, that's why you need people like me to write these kinds of books that would help to lay things out for them so that they could get a, we try to simplify it as much as possible. Um, I think part of the problem is how to expose them to this type of reading rather than merely to uh, students. But um, when you simplify this type of uh, complex structure, complex system of production to working people, then they should be able to have a better understanding and a better appreciation of their role in the system and the way that they're being um, cheated of their labor. Right. And, and there's many industries that you kind of touch upon within this book, um, including the extraction of natural resources in the mining and timber industries 
And you talk of the long monthly shifts that these workers have to live away from their families. Um, do you think that these long shifts create a sense of alienation amongst the workers? Concerning the theories of alienation from Karl Marx, do you believe that the workers are alienated from both the process and themselves? Yeah, the workers are alienated, but not merely because they are far away from home and they work for long periods away from home. They're alienated from the production process in themselves in that their products are the embodiment of their labor, which becomes estranged from them and consumed by whoever uses their products. The commodities that we consume are really the embodied labor of the worker that produced the commodity. So that when we consume our cell phone, meaning we, we have a cell phone that we use, now that cell phone comprises the labor of the people who produce the cell phone. So the people who produce that cell phone, you don't know them, but their labor is contained within the cell phone. So that labor becomes alienated labor it's alienated from the worker. So the worker then is alienated in that sense. Um, the capitalist and the worker both represent the same human self-alienation, whereby the capitalist being satisfied and affirmed in their self-alienation, while the worker feels destroyed by his alienation from the process, seeing it in his own impotence and the reality of an inhuman existence. So. The worker as worker doesn't see any bright future for himself in this process. He's alienated, but a capitalist in his alienation, he's all right because he can have, um, you know, the, uh, the finer things in life compared with the worker. So that um, the worker's alienation represents the contradiction between his human nature and his life situation which is a blatant denial of his very nature. This is an antagonistic contradiction that can only be resolved when the capitalist system collapses at the behest of working class action. And do you think that this uh, capitalist expenditure that's happening um, is kind of reminiscent of the proletariat uprising seen in the works of Karl Marx and Engels in the Communist Manifesto? Well, the workers have um, the idea that Marx and Engels addressed, and especially um, works in the like class struggles in France and the um, works that analyze the French Revolution. Those works really show that the um, workers, if given the opportunity and if they're united as a working force, can actually um, govern themselves. And we've seen that, uh, but when workers are given the opportunity to govern themselves, or when they take the opportunity to govern themselves, there's usually a general pushback against things like those. So that, uh, and as we've seen it in France, what happened with the, um, the, the communes that they established, the, working, the workers' communes that they established, the French aristocracy, was able to crush the resistance of the workers. So again, we're going to move a little bit further into the book here, um, staying with the theme of Karl Marx and Engels. At the bottom of page 123, you write, and I quote, property-less miners had to survive by selling their labor power to the owners of nature who hired them to work in the natural resources sector. Uh, from this quote, do you think that the concept of labor selling their human labor as a source of a commodity is reminiscent of the economic theory of capital circulation um, that Karl Marx describes of the proletariats and the capitalists? Well, yes. They, um, there's a formula that they, or two formulas are formulated that uh, that um, one can find in the literature on this subject. And one is um, MCM, which is the first circuit, as it's called, of capital, which involves the circulation of commodities. So 1M is what 
a commodity is sold for money, and then the money is used to buy another commodity. So we have M, money, buying a commodity, and then we use that commodity, we, we um, use that commodity to buy the money to buy another commodity. Now that's called the um, circuit of uh, commodities. But then in the other circuit, which is called M, C, M prime, it's different in the sense that, um, Peter, I don't have a board here to demonstrate it or to illustrate it. MCM prime is different in the sense that it is a capitalist relation. It's a circuit of money. So you have a circuit of capital and a circuit of money. In the circuit of money, in this case, the capitalist uses his money to buy a commodity, which he then sells for more money. So in this case, the capitalist uses his money to buy a commodity, meaning your labor power, and then to sell it, and then to produce a commodity which he sells for, for more money. So it's like if you're a businessman, and you hire some workers, you produce a commodity, the worker produces a commodity, and then you sell the commodity for more money. So the first set of money that you use to hire the worker is less than the second set of money you collect from selling the worker's product. Now, the difference between the M and the M prime would represent what you call profit and what, in a Marxist sense, they might refer to as surplus value. All right, so we're going to move into chapter six, um, where you really focused on Guyana. Um, and in this chapter, you state that Guyana became part of the international division of labor. By becoming a supplier of raw materials or natural resources, um, and that their economy depended on these newfound center periphery relations with the capitalist countries. Um, do you believe that it would be a true statement to conclude that the situation in Guyana could be compared to Emile Durkheim's theory on Anami and the forced divisions of labor that come from capitalism? Well, Durkheim's theory of the division of labor has a different meaning in that his concern is to distinguish the functions and causes of the division of labor from those of uh, Adam Smith, the classical political economist. Durkheim too called himself a classical political economist in some part of his readings. But whereas Smith's economic argument is that the division of labor increases production, which is a fact, and that it increases happiness, which is not so much of a fact. Durkheim wants to show that the real functions of the division of labor is to maintain stability and solidarity in society, and that as capitalist societies advances, there is a preponderance of the division of labor. In other words, the Durkheimian approach to the division of labor is a sociological one. Smith's approach to the division of labor is an economic one. Smith's concern is with how we use the division of labor to engage in mass production so that we can have as all the many things that you have, your nice shirts, etc. Whereas um, Durkheim's understanding of the division of labor, he wants us to see how the division of labor keeps us as a society as a society, keeps us in balance. The term we use was solidarity. Now, the international division of labor that Guyana fits into is really an economic argument in that the country produces raw materials to be manufactured in the developed capitalist countries into finished products. So when we say international division of labor, what we're referring to really is the fact that a country such as Guyana, or Venezuela, or the country in Latin America, or in Africa, the so-called third world countries, they specialize in the production of raw materials, like minerals and um, metals and oil and agricultural produce. And those produce, agricultural produce, minerals and oils, they're taken, they're exported to Europe 
or to the developed capitalist countries, America, United States, and to Europe. And then they're manufactured into finished products like your cell phones, etc. And then they're sold back to the countries, to Guyana, and to uh, the countries of the third world. So Guyana then would specialize the type of labor, the type of industry you have in Guyana would be industries that specialize in the production of raw materials so that the labor that you employ would be labor engaged in agriculture, etc. Whereas in the rich developed countries, the type of labor that you have would be labor that is more specialized in manufacturing. So it's more high tech compared with this, the labor in say a country such as Guyana. So when we say the international division of labor, you could divide the world up like that. You could show that there is, uh, that some countries, some parts of the world, they employ a certain kind of labor producing raw materials. And in another part of the world, they employ another, a sort of kind of labor that produce finished products, manufactured products. So if you take your cell phones as an example, you'll be amazed to know that the cobalt that, they, that, that is uh, used in the production of your phones that might come from a place like uh, the Congo in Africa, men actually use their fingers to dig the earth up to extract the cobalt. But then it goes someplace else. The cobalt is exported to some other country that manufactures it using high-tech labor into your cell phone. So the international division of labor is like that. That's how we tend to define it. And do you think this international division of labor that you talked about in Guyana or the Congo or a lot of these periphery countries is kind of a forced element of capitalism that they have to engage in this situation? Well, um, the In the first case, this notion of anomie that you spoke about earlier um, is a breakdown in the division of labor where its constituent parts fail to function because the division of labor would mean that each of us carry out a specific function in the society that causes the society to be a society. And when we fail to perform our function, our specific function, the society breaks down, there is a breakdown. And that's anomie. And so um, the anomie that is the manifestation of division of labor is, is also referred to as a pathological sort of a situation, a pathology, a social pathology, it's pathological forms. So the Forced divisional labor produces dissension rather than solidarity. The forced divisional labor doesn't produce solidarity. What it does, it produces dissension and the society becomes, because people don't like to be forced to do things. And so um, the solidarity is only maintained, this is Durkheimian sociology, the solidarity is only maintained from sort of a voluntary process of the divisional labor where you can do work based on your aptitude or what you want to do as this thing from being forced to do it. Now examples of forced divisional labor would be like slavery or um, in the caste system where we've had, um, it's still in existence, the caste system in certain parts of the world where there isn't mobility within the system, there isn't social mobility. Uh, moving again further into the book, you still focus on Guyana, and you mentioned a lot of s political economics in this chapter. Um, you talked about the racial divide in Guyana, which we briefly mentioned earlier. And do you think that this racial divide in Guyana occurred as a result of the PPP political party, which was just a political party in Guyana, um, splitting into two separate entities? created a lack of class consciousness amongst the majority of the working class in Guyana? And would you constitute that, this divide, as a class struggle 
as theorized by Karl Marx. Now, the split in the PPP in Guyana, the PPP meaning the People's Progressive Party, did affect the class consciousness of the Guyanese working people in that the split was on the basis of um, race. So you had the East Indians aligning themselves with the People's Progressive Party and the African Guyanese aligned themselves with the People's National Congress. And as a result of this split of that party, the workers, working people, were now engaging these two forces rather than engaging in their class consciousness to fight against those who were controlling them. So it's back to the question of um, the class control or class manipulation of racial divisions. So the consciousness really of the workers was uh, hampered because of the, they were manipulated into um, going in these two racial camps. And so I think that the race divide was basically a facade Whereas the real issue was an issue of class, the East Indian and African ruling elites manipulated the state power for themselves, secured state power for themselves, and then manipulated the workers in collaboration with um, British and US interests. Because you cannot rule out the um, role of the British and the role of the US in the manipulation of class struggles in Guyana, the, the, the race issues in Guyana. And these things are documented in books. So if you like to read books, if you read Arthur Schlesinger, A Thousand Days in the White, JFK, A Thousand Days in the White House, if you read um, Philip Aggi, Inside the Company, you'll see what I'm talking about, the role of the US, the role of the British in the manipulating and causing the racial divide, etc. in Guyana. Um, there was also historical external dimension to the, the manipulation of the race divide. And the race divide is best derived from a class perspective using the Marxist model, in my, to my mind, rather than the ethnic composition model. The race divide is a class phenomenon, the ma manipulation of race to fulfill class interests. And do you think that this manipulation of the classes and the race divide and the fighting that occurred in Guyana between these two groups would have occurred if the US or Great Britain did not really intervene on behalf of the political party and natural resources? Yeah, um, I, I, it's difficult to say what would have happened if that didn't happen. But um, it's better to say what actually happened. And what happened was really was a part of the Cold War politics. The Cold War politics was uh, the US versus the former Soviet Union. The US headed capitalist world versus the Soviet Union headed, the former Soviet Union headed socialist world in something called the Cold War. So the Cold War was played out in countries such as Guyana by the Soviet Union and the US supporting two factions within it. Same thing happened in Vietnam. And so as a result of these two, um, the, the, in, the intervention by these two foreign powers, then the two people ended up fighting. But prior to that, they were living happily. They had issues and so on, but they weren't as, um, there was no open racial divide in that country. And still going along with the idea of this um, political party split in the PPP in Guyana, before the split of the party, do you think that the idea of natural ownership over the natural resources could constitute as a developmental model, or was this simply just a facade for the crisis reform model that is known about capitalism? Well, the PPP, when they pursued um, a nationalist policy in Guyana, they were really operating within a colonial context. 
And so it's difficult to my mind to um, understand how a neo-colonial state such as what obtained under the PPP would find it almost, would find it possible to create a development model that would really uh, suit the rank and file and bring genuine development to the country. So I think that uh, in a real sense, do what they did or attempted to do was good. I don't think you can really base a development model on what they've done. Um, it's the same thing with the new extractivist model that we found in Latin America, what the book is based on. Because in Latin America, the neo-extractivists or the new extractivists, the people who were quote unquote part of the pink revolution or the pink tide in Latin America, where uh, you know red meaning communist, pink someplace in between, um, the pink tide in Latin America, the people who were like in Evo Morales in Bolivia and Hugo Chavez in, um, in Venezuela as examples. Now, what they were doing was implemented measures to maintain a greater share of the wealth from the natural resources they exported in order to invest in social programs, which was a good thing. But the critique that is being made in this book is that they didn't go far enough. It's good to maintain that, maintain a greater portion of the wealth for yourselves. But then at the same time, even though you've maintained a greater portion of wealth for yourself, um, it's still a quote unquote business as usual in terms of the extraction of um, the wealth to the developed capitalist countries. And you kind of mentioned that earlier when we had spoke that Cuba would be a better example for which this transformation of capitalist production kind of took place. And what kind of sets Cuba significantly off or different from the Guyanese relationship to these economic assets? Well. You ask the U.S. because Cuba was so far out to the left that the U.S. decided to slap sanctions on them and to keep them out of the cold right up until today. And this is because Cuba really hurt in terms of um, the economic system that they put in place. They took over all the foreign companies and made them Cuban companies. And so that was different. That's the only country in this hemisphere that actually went that way and the next was Venezuela and you see what is happening in Venezuela today because we here in the US don't like that because it's too um, it's a complete turn in the way the economies are organized where the, the money the wealth goes to the poor and they are able to enjoy a better quality of life compared with what obtained in the past so the Cuban model really, I wouldn't compare it to, the Cuban model, model is revolutionary. Because if you understand what happened in Cuba, Fidel Castro and his um, July 25th movement, they actually um, staged a revolution. They actually captured power by waging guerrilla warfare in Cuba. But in Guyana, they won power by the, by the ballots through the electoral system. It was a different system. And therefore, um, the, the, the models aren't the same. But Cuba is the only model in the region that we could point to as one in which there was a genuine attempt to capture the resources for themselves. All right, so this is going to conclude the interview portion. Um, I'd love to thank Dr. Canterbury for coming here and answering all these questions about his wonderful book, Neo Extractivism and Capitalist Development. And at this time, we will open if anyone has any questions for Dr. Canterbury. No? All right. All right, so please give a round of applause to Dr. Canterbury and his amazing work. <laughs> So
So on behalf of the Sociology Club, I would like to thank Dr. Canterbury and Emily Grout for being here today and sharing this incredibly important research. I would also like to thank you all for coming to this wonderful event and encourage you all to continue learning about the topics discussed today, including globalization, economic inequality, the resource curse, capitalism, race and ethnic relations, and everything in between. These are especially pertinent topics in today's society and impact people's everyday lives. I hope you can take Dr. Canterbury's research with you and relate it back to your own lives and perhaps your own research. I'd like to again thank you all for your time and coming out on a Friday afternoon. Um, if you have any questions, um, we will stay back for a few more minutes, um, but if not, have a great afternoon. Thank you.